Great seats. Do you mind? No. Nope. Okay, finally. First off, and how many Jack, folks do we have? I'm going to leave the cover off. We have the same, we have, we have 10 Jesus. people again. Do we have anybody new? I'm just the junior every day. And who is I? Jennifer Mulder. Hi. Hi. Get her back. So, can somebody count for me again, I'm not please? Sure. Sure. Yeah. Do we have 11 done? Eight. 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 Okay. Thank you, though. No, I appreciate it. Well, there's 10. Okay, so uh, that means there's one person who's not here last time. It's Tim, and I don't know where he is because I saw him. We're here. It's uh, Mahita. My, <laughs> Sorry. I knew where you were. Oh, oh, yeah. I already heard. Um, from Sunny. Oh, it's Mahana. Mahana. He well, said Mahana, that he wasn't yeah. signed up for the class yet. That's right. Okay. He's the only one. I think uh, I, haven't, I haven't even written down the class list yet so I obviously will but that's cool 10 is a good number and also I haven't really mentioned it but we're uh, the class is being videotaped as you know or you wouldn't be in this classroom and uh, so we've got we've got people out here in video land uh, that, how many of you have never been in in a videotaped classroom before a bunch of you right yes. right it's um, Usually people are kind of paranoid at first, but I assume you get over it. Some of you guys have been in here a whole lot of, a whole lot by now. You don't pay attention anymore, do you? Or do you? You're asleep. <laughs> you still pay attention to it? Of course, Jackie never pays any attention to anybody watching. So. What? I mean, you're kind of a bold person anyway. Bold? I would admit to Not that. Not shy is what I really meant. I would admit to that. I will take on that response. But, I don't know. Anyway, so, uh, the important part of it is that when you ask a question or speak up, it's relatively important that you do it without whispering. That is, that you do it fairly assertively or people in, the, uh, <clears throat> in video land can't help, can't hear you. So, please speak up. And, uh, it used to be in the old days that when you spoke up, they had three or four cameras, and whoever was speaking up, they turned the camera to you. Cool. But they don't do that anymore. It's uh, we, we used to have a an engineer who, who just ran the room, and, and they focused on whoever was speaking. And so you don't have to worry about that anymore. You don't get one cam camera anymore. You just they just do the audio and have the class and everybody. Mostly they focus on me. So. Uh, like I said, the outline is ready and I'll get to you right away. Uh, the only thing that it's on there is basically it's, it's, it gives you the number of sessions, it gives you the date for the sessions, and it gives you the content in that session, and kind of it's an outline of notes, and then uh, it'll give you the readings for the session, and then the assignment related to the session. <clears throat> so it's pretty much ABC cookbook. Can you tell us what type of assignments we're going to have? Uh, no. We just right. take class time and it doesn't really, I mean, it's just, like I said last time, it's just practical stuff like writing a lesson plan, teaching somebody, do, doing an interview, uh, writing objectives, things like that. Real practical things. But I'm not going to go on ABC because we don't have time. So last time, we all we did was sort of talk about what a re what a vision rehabilitation therapist is, and we gave this kind of general interview with heading. What are the headings? We said we did it in verbs. They're teachers, and they're what else? Managers. Teachers, managers. Advocates. Advocates. Counselors. Counselors. Anything else? What's the advocate role? Mm -hmm. What's the advocate role? 
Well, depending on which agency you're working in, you may have to advocate for your client to get more teaching opportunity or to get more education or more um, equipment, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. There's one more you haven't mentioned, like public educator. And if you end up working in the field someplace, well, even if you work in the center commonly, <coughs> there'll be all kinds of uh, groups in the, in the uh, community calling you and as the sort of expert about vision, asking you to come and talk to the line club or whoever about, about what blindness means or what low vision means or blah, blah. That, uh, at Disability Network, we have somebody who's an advocate who gets people with disabilities together yeah. to work towards, you know, a goal or changing something in the community. You know what that's called? I mean, sometimes, you know, tell these people what Disability Network means first. It's a, it's a center for independent living. Uh, it's a, a federally mandated program that has centers all over the country. And they provide uh, a number of different services to the community, information or referral. Uh, independent living skills, advocacy, education, about all about disability. Kind of a consumer-based group that does public education and services, etc. What's it called again, Tim? We'll, we'll get to it. It's, okay. called, it's called the Disability Network and comes okay. to, it's called all kinds of things around the country. Okay. It's a Center for Independent Living, a CIL. Uh, but what I was trying to get at is most places have something like a Speakers Bureau and the Disability Network has one, and that's what he's talking about. We have the Speaker's Bureau, meaning somebody in that agency has charge of um, a group of people who are willing to go out and talk about this or that or the other thing. But Kalamazoo is a, rare, a rarity of all the places in Southwest Michigan, of all the towns in Southwest Michigan, you're looking at the one with such a place. All the rest of them don't have such a place. If you're working in Niles or the hundred other little communities around here, it's likely to be you. So, and even if even if it is Kalamazoo, you're very likely to be part of that speaker bureau, and you being called on to be the blindness or low vision specialist of the group. So, very common. Um, do like do RTs like also um, like make the consumer into these roles? Make what? Like the consumer, like, um, you know, to an extent, like an advocate or an educator. I hope so, for sure. You mean, you mean, you mean help, the, help consumers become part of that whole education advocacy role? Yeah, I hope so, for sure. Okay. <clears throat> because that's, as far as I'm concerned, that's your role. Um, the other one is public educator. I, don't know if I did mention that, so there you go. Um, then we talk real quickly about the, uh, the vocabulary used. And my primary primary interest here is that you just get into person first language. Yeah, you know the difference between blindness, legal blindness, low vision, visual impairment. Any question about this? Four term. So what I want to do today then is talking about, uh, back and forth a bit, about in order to know really what uh, professionals do, you really have to know what the system is, like who serves people who have visual impairment. And in essence, there are five major, five major systems that provide services to people with visual impairment. <coughs> Um, the biggest one is, is the so-called federal state rehabilitation VR services. I say federal state because it's a, it's a combination and I'll come back to it in a minute. I'm just going to list them. So the biggest is the so-called federal state VR vocational rehab system. Probably the next federal big, state VR system? Mm -hmm, federal slash state. Basically, it's like 80% federal, 20% state funding. But I'll talk about it real specifically in a minute. So I'm just listing 
The second one is the Veterans Affairs or Veterans System. <coughs> Uh, the, the next one is uh, the private system, okay. meaning meaning not run by any state agency, but private. What would be an example of private? Private is like goodwill. Okay. <clears throat> Usually community based, meaning within a service given relatively small community area, not always though. Because the fourth one is a private one, and I'll just call it CNIB, CNIB, which is a Canadian system talk about it because some of you may end up working there. It's private too, but it, but it covers the whole country of Canada. And then the fifth one is the educational system, which mostly you won't end up in, but you might. <clears throat> they also hire BRTs someplace. And what I want to talk about really is you know how these things, how these things are set up, what they look like. So you just know a little bit about how they work. Um, the federal state one, by far the biggest, by far costs the most, by far serves the most people. And it's mostly what we're going to talk about because even though a lot of you might end up working in the Veterans Administration system, uh, this one is the most comprehensive, which means that if we use them as a model, then you're going to get every step of all of the of the kind of services and every step of what you need to do to plan and assess and and all of that so it's way way the most comprehensive so even if you go off to another another system you need to know this one because like i said it it will cover every step of what you need to know about <coughs> providing services um, the federal state one is is interesting because of the, the the feds provide most of the money and the state provides most of the service. In other words, the federal government from uh, the Department of Education, that is the Federal Department of Education, and a subdivision called Rehabilitation Services Administration. That was an interesting one. <laughs> Okay. It was like you tried to catch it. You shouldn't have catch coughs. I tried. You could end up with broken ears. <laughs> <clears throat> anyway, this federal state, the federal state one is uh, mostly it's 80% or 75%, depending on the program, covered by the money of the federal government and 25 or 20% covered by state. And the state provides all of the people and the actual services and the feds just provide the oversight. What's oversight mean? Dispensing the money, basically. Hmm? Dispensing the money? Uh, oversight. <clears throat> no, that's not oversight. I was going to suggest um, accountability and supervision. Yes. They come and do the audits and they make sure, well, they try to anyway, <laughs> make sure the money's not where it's supposed to be and all that. So. They come and do audits and read your books and check on your <coughs> how you spend the money. Um, and they provide they provide regulations on how paperwork is supposed to look and the state does that? No. For the federal? Yeah, all of the how to do it and how it's supposed to be done all comes from laws that are written. Uh, and that the Vocational Rehabilitation Act, it's called, I'm not going to go into it in great detail here, but the Vocational Rehabilitation Act is amended like every five years. It started way back 
like in the 20s and it gets updated about every five years and that law tells all the states how they're supposed to do this rehabilitation process. And then it, then it over, basically there's a law written and then from the law comes regulations about how you're supposed to do things at the state level. So they're not laws, but they're strong regulation. <clears throat> and then they go about checking that you really do, did follow the regulations or guess what happened? The 80% doesn't get to be coming your way anymore. So the state really does toe the line in terms of money. Well, isn't it true that Michigan doesn't even have enough money to pull down its full 80% that it could receive? Yeah, commonly. So that's called, that 20% or 25%, depending on the program, is called match, state match. So if Michigan can't come up with the 20 or 25%, then they won't get the 80%. Um, Can the federal she's been she's been involved in a in a program that's gotten some money from the state, and she she knows that uh, that the state hasn't been able to pull all their eighty percent in in a particular program because they haven't been able to match the money. They match the money in all kinds of ways. They don't just get it from the state legislature. They also get to count like if I run a sports camp here. And they give me a little some money to help run that sports camp and it cost i don't know ten thousand dollars to run it they can also use my ten thousand dollars to get how much if it's 80 20 percent forty thousand but the issue is that this, this the federal government is stepping in and saying that if it's not strictly vocationally based that it shouldn't be used for match money right well, yeah maybe <laughs> Can they really you, you're hearing somebody's interpretation of that, so I don't know if it's true or not. Right. Pardon me? I, I'm sorry. No, I was just wondering, can the like federal government, can they like make it into also like an unfunded mandate too? Yeah. Okay. So could they like say, you know, like for instance, like the state has to do this for, for, for voc rehab, but we're just not going to like give you any money for it at all? Sure. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. The money that we get here that we hand on to you guys. You know, it has all sorts of regulations <coughs> stuck to it. Like we're supposed to follow you guys for, for the next 100 years to see if you actually go work there. And it's quite a pain. <clears throat> it causes God knows how much paperwork. But, you know, you have to have oversight. Otherwise, you're back in the 1940s with Fort Merrill, this and that, and people going off and having parties instead of providing service. Um, <clears throat> anyway, back to the... So, uh, I should say this. The, the VR agency, the state... Okay, when I say VR agency, I'm now talking about the state version of it. So the agency within a state can be set up in a lot of ways. Usually there's kind of three uh, ways it, it is set up. One is it can be a, a, a general vocational rehabilitation agency, meaning for all disability. So many states like Illinois, for example, have one agency and it serves everybody. Other states have one that is that serves um, people with all kinds of disabilities in one group and people who are visually impaired in another group. In other words, a separate agency for people with visual impairment. Why would that happen? Because the blind were the first to be recognized, perhaps? Well, they also have a lot of political power. And it goes back a long ways when politicians, you know, it's easy to convince them that blindness is a special thing. And for years and years, they've considered it that. And it's been played up as that. And then the third kind is, I don't know, it's kind of a, it's kind of a combination where 
it's really a general agency, but the money for the um, for the for, for vision comes straight from the governor's office, even though it's a general program. Does that make sense? In other words, if it's a, if it's a general agency, what happens is all the money comes to the governor, and then the governor or the state office of VR decides how they're going to hand it to who, whatever agency. However, in some states where it's a combined program, they send it and say, like in Michigan, they send it and say, okay, 85% of it goes to general rehab and 15 goes to blindness and mobility. So the money's divided in a specific way. Yeah. And everybody in, in our field is always pushing really hard for the, for the specific blindness low vision agency, of course, because then the money comes directly from the governor's office, directly from the legislature, and you have a lot more control over it. Once it goes to an umbrella agency or whatever, then it's easy for, for the other people to nitpick it and grab it and take 2% for this and 1% for that. So if you go to this state, then you've got, even though it looks like a general agency in some ways, you've got something called the commission. And the commission means, in essence, that it's separated. So if you hear the word commission, it's either totally separated or it's a general agency with, the, with blindness and low vision pulled out funding-wise. <coughs> And now VR is also broken up into two major programs. One is the, the, the traditional so-called uh, vocational rehabilitation, and I'll, and I'll call it job-related vocational program. So VR program, traditional VR program. The other is called independent living rehabilitation and it's capitalized it's a proper noun independent living rehabilitation or independent living program so you have VR programs within the within the state you have two kinds of, of rehab programs one is called vocational rehabilitation programming and the other one is called independent living rehabilitation the difference is nothing other than Independent living rehabilitation is non-vocational. In other words, it's aimed at people who are not after job. So this, the very first, so the very first uh, 1920s legislation was written for who? VR or independent living? Independent living. <laughs> Who do you think the world thinks more important? People the guy who who's after a job or the guy who isn't? Jobs. The guy who's after the job. So that's uh, that part. That's that that part of the, of the law stood until 1978. It was totally only vocational until 1978, at which time the independent living program was brought to the fore. And what happened in the late 60s and early 70s? that would have forced people to pay attention to multiply impaired people. Civil rights movement. But where did it come from? From the war? Mm -hmm. Which war? World War II. <clears throat> Vietnam. <clears throat> oh. My era. The flower children <clears throat> and all that <laughs> stuff. But, hey, <clears throat> when people came back from Vietnam, all that, uh, <clears throat> all that, um, Independence and feeling your oats and long hair and having fun was was going on. And when those guys came back from the war with multiple appearance, they said, "Bull crap, we're going to get served too, whether we're going to go get a job or not." So, and and of course, in Berkeley is where it started, and now it's spread everywhere. And there's one in Kalamazoo. Which is which uh, Tim just mentioned. That is an independent living center, funded by the part of the, uh, the 
of the law that uh, funds non-vocational programs. So if I say to you, it's independent living money, I mean a proper noun with a very specific meaning. <clears throat> I'm not just talking about, say, like activities of daily living or some other general term. I'm talking about a very specific thing. So if I ask you on a test and you see capitalized, independent, capitalized living, it means one very specific thing even though I'm not going to give you a test. I'm going to give you a, I'm going to give you a take home final. That's it. And it's going to be just a real, it won't be objective, it will be you thinking. Are most of your tests based on notes or your stuff in the book? It will be on you searching out stuff. That's oh, what it will okay. be. Um, Okay, so independent living and vocational rehabilitation. What percentage goes to which, would you guess? 50-50? Mm -hmm. More like, I don't know what it is these days. I think it's 1585. What? I think it's 1585. Yeah, something like that. that that's what it, it used to be. Mm -hmm. 10, it's probably about 15 or so independent living. There is one other little tricky way, though, that... VR has, well, I'm not going to do that, I'll wait. <clears throat> We're going to talk about it later. So, in essence, there's two problems. Wait, what percentage goes, hmm? what percentage goes to? Um, it's something like 85, 15. It's very high for VR, very low for independent living. That's the point. I'm not going to ask you some specific question about what percentage is. Very high, very low. Okay. I, that 1978 act is called the Title VII. You know what? Of a, a federal law, do you know what a title and a, and a part and a chapter is? Uh, you'll, you'll often hear people say, title so, so, part so and so, chapter so and so. Um, they're set up in, they're set up the big, um, the biggest part of a law the biggest subdivision is a part. So you, I told you that it gets reviewed about every five years. <clears throat> well, but every time it gets reviewed and they write a new, a new uh, <coughs> part, and a new section, it becomes part this and part that. So part seven was written in 1978 and included independent living rehabilitation. And under that, there are Part A, Part B, Part C, and um, I'm not really going to push that because you got a whole class in in laws. But uh, part is the second division, and then within that there are chapters. <clears throat> so the title is what it is. What you're saying. This is right? Title Seven, Independent Living. That's like title that. One would be then, the very first title was Vocational Rehabilitation. Vocational <clears throat> okay, the VR process, it has basically, if you lose your vision, there are five steps that the state goes through to get you served. And I'll just list them first and then we'll talk about them real quick. <clears throat> First is eligibility determination. Second is program assessment. Uh, then there's a, <clears throat> a program plan. Then there's something called personal adjustment training. Again, proper noun. And commonly you'll see it uh, PAT, capital I. <clears throat> and then third, vocational services. That is what I mean if I say to you rehabilitation. Although, 
lots of times when you hear people say rehabilitation, they're really just talking about the fourth part. So let's talk about what these parts mean. The first step is, is pretty obvious, eligibility for determination. So if you lose your vision in Michigan, the first thing they're going to do is try to figure out if you really are legally blind. Or if you're not, that you're going to be virtually for sure soon. So, so that's just a matter of like testing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's, a, that's a test that the ophthalmologist offers. <clears throat> and they usually send you to somebody of, of their own choosing. So it isn't some, you know, some, somebody from your little hometown who's trying to get you some services. <clears throat> Then the second step is once they de decide that yes, you're eligible for services. And so if I say to you, you must be legally blind to get services in Michigan, is that true? No. no. You must be legally blind or have the potential for it, the strong potential for it. <coughs> the second step then is, is an assessment. And this is a so-called program assessment, meaning that a counselor is going to come to your house and sit down with you and spend a whole lot of time with you and also looking into your case history to figure out, okay, where has this person been? What kind of job has this person done? Uh, what, kind of a, what kind of a goal, a, a vocational goal that we want, for, does this person want? What kind of training is it going to take to get the person to that goal? Uh, all the steps of training. And that, that doesn't just include like the skills of, the so-called skills of blindness and low vision. That also includes things like, we've got to make this person look good enough to get a job if, uh, if they got ratty clothes. Or we can do things like mm, prosthetic eyes or prosthetic limbs or anything that will make this person more employable. So that's part of the assessment. It's a big, large program assessment trying to figure out <clears throat> what we can do to help this person get a job. Then the third step is to write in Michigan something called the IPE, <clears throat> Individual Plan for Employment. Anybody know the old term for it? Still used some places. IWRP, Individualized Written Rehabilitation Plan, but you won't see it anymore. And that's one of the things that the feds change. You know, that's when they say, okay, from now on you're calling it IPE. And if it comes from, what would it be called if it was uh, an independent living one? IPE. Uh, no, because that has employment in it. ILP. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so. Independent living plan. Okay. And you'll find in Canada it's called an independent plan for, what is it called? IPP, independent. I don't know. I got to look when, it, when we get to Canada. I got to look at my own notes. I don't remember. But it's an IPP in Michigan. Uh, Canada. <laughs> Uh, so, so you, so the counselor, still the counselor, still not you, writes the IP, IP. However, that counselor almost always comes to you and says, "How many hours do you need to provide personal adjustment training to this person?" Which is step one. Four. That's step four. That's where you come in, whether you're an O&M instructor, a, rehab, a vision rehab therapist, a counselor, I mean a therapeutic counselor. Because what kind of counselor am I talking about who writes these plans and does that assessment? Is that a therapeutic counselor or what? It's a rehab counselor. That's a rehab counselor. That's a different kind of counselor. That's the kind in this program. Not that they don't also do therapeutic counseling. 
but in their role of assessment and plan writing, they're really a caseworker. They're setting up this program. So okay, now we're in step four, almost. Can because, I ask a quick question? Because mm -hmm. you said the counselor asked them how many hours would it take you to get uh, personally adjusted. That's basically. right. Now, that means the counselor is addressing that question to who? BRT. Okay. When I'm talking in this class and say you, I'm talking to BRTs. So the counselor would ask the BRT how long would it take Joe to get to... Ready to go on to step five. Okay, okay. Which is... <laughs> Five services. is vocational services. That's right. So, so step four is personal adjustment training, which simply means all these so-called skills that we teach to get people to read and write and do math and take care of their, themselves and their homes and all those things, so that they're then ready to go, <clears throat> ready to go into a job or job training. So, step five then is vocational training, which could have as many as three parts, which could be what? What's the first one? What's the first, what's the first thing you do anytime you get a new person? Communication. Nope. Get to know them better. Uh, well, yeah, but. Do intake of some kind? You do an assessment. You always do an assessment. Even if it's even if you've been seeing this person for 50 days, on 50 day, day 51 you start, you assess what they know about day 50. If you see them for the very first time in a vocational program, you sit down, you figure out where they've been, what, where do we start here. So always the first step is an assessment. So you're doing a vocational assessment. The second step then is training them in some vocational way, and the third step is. Placing them. So if you learn anything from this class, the first thing ever, always, if it's the first day or the hundredth day in the first minute, it's always watching. That's the thing You're wasting my time if you don't know what I know when we start. You've all been there, right? You've all had people sit down, if you've taken guitar lessons or piano lessons or anything, and the person pays no attention to what you know, and they say, okay, today we're going to learn string four. And you go, Jesus, I've been playing this thing for three years. What do you mean, string four? Give me a break. You've been there, haven't you? Yeah, what do you know? Yeah. If they don't know that I've been performing on stage for three years, and they start telling me what, what notes are on string four, I'm getting up and walking out. <laughs> so that's all I mean. Um, like, how interactive, though, is, is the RT with, or the, the, the cancer with, like, I guess the client? And, like, the, I mean, because if the, if the counselor says to the RT, well, how many hours is it going to take you to do personal adjustment Down training? the line. I'm going to pass that question off. Okay. We're going to spend three days talking about how to do that. Okay? Okay. Way interactive. You're going to spend hours and hours figuring that out. You're not going to sit down and just talk to them or guess it. Or you're going to do a, a three-step process, find it out. So we're going to get to that. <laughs> you're trying to get me on my lesson plan. I'm going to... And I'm going to teach you never to do that. Sorry. No, no, it's fine. <laughs> I'm just making an example here to tell you, you know, it, I'm, I, that question, and it has nothing to do with you. It's a good question. But I'm telling you that it's, it's, about, it's about six days from here, and I'm not jumping to it because there's a whole bunch of background that's got to go. And you've got to do the same thing when people jump ahead on you. Okay, the role of the BRT in, the, in this VR program then? <clears throat> well, basically, it's teaching the skills in the personal adjustment training program. Simple as that. You could be working in, in that system, you could be working in any one of 
several settings, though. We talked the other day about it. What settings? <laughs> quick, 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 quick. Center based. Centers or itinerant. Itinerant or or what? Community based. Yeah, well, what's the difference between community based and itinerant? Uh, don't you mean itinerant people may go into homes and they have clients yeah. individually as cases? So if you're working in some town like uh, mm. Flint, <laughs> all right? you're working in Flint and you've got this little agency there, is the only way you can serve them, even though you've got two people in your little agency, is the only way you can serve them by going out to their home? you got to think broader. You can also bring them to four or five of them to a group somewhere to, to the church kitchen or or to the bus station or to the whatever um, but we'll come back to that um, there's lots and lots of things between those two settings okay it's not just in their home or in centers there's a hundred other ways to build or, or to serve people so that they get interaction with other people Side you. Okay, here we go. The Veterans Affairs System. <clears throat> it's set up quite differently. They also, though, have center based and field based services. The traditional veterans, the traditional one that most, that, that was first and that most people know about, are so called blind centers, blind rehabilitation centers, big hospitals. Anybody know the names of any? Heinz. Heinz VA and Heinz Veterans Hospital in Chicago area. Anybody know any others? There's one in Birmingham, there's one in one in Georgia. One in Georgia. There's one in California. There's in West Haven, Connecticut. There's two versions of it. There's a 30 bed and a 15 bed version. There's a brand new one in California that's open like this month. This month. Yeah, Long Beach. It's a 15 bed, I think. <laughs> they just opened two or three of that size. Another one in Mississippi. Also. And uh, so they're, they're traditional uh, residential centers where people come from all around, stay there in the residence, get, get a, a program at the center. Uh, they, have, they also, though, have uh, <coughs> field-based services. Um, uh, two major Two major players are somebody called uh, Visual Impairment Service Coordinator, a VIS Coordinator, B-I-S. Again, it's a proper noun. And that person primarily is a caseworker, a person who goes out and finds and, and recruits. They call them patients in the VA system. And also does follow up and helps with jobs and gets gets them things, you know, gadgets and prosthetics. They, by the way, they call they call things like uh, computers and such prosthetics. <laughs> I don't. The VA, the Veterans Administration has always done that. So, if you want a new calculator, that's a prosthetic in the VA system. Um, <clears throat> so that's a VIS coordinator. There's also somebody called a, a BROS worker, B-R-O-S, Blind Rehabilitation Outreach Services, R -O -S. That is somebody who goes out and actually provides services, just like a field-based uh, vision rehab teacher. Only to veterans, though, is that yeah, right? Yeah, we're talking veterans here. Totally veterans. When I said the veteran system, I meant they only serve veterans. 
and they have they have far more funding, far better this and that. They pay more money to their employees, etc. There are a lot more paperwork. Mm -hmm. There are a lot more paperwork. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily. That's definitely not necessarily. Um, and then, and there's there's quite a few of those. The, the VA is set up in, they call them, vision visions, like V. I think it's V I S O N S. It really means, um, like sections of the country, areas, divisions is what it really means. And I can't remember how many there are, like six or something. I don't remember. But each each of those so-called visions has a center, has a, a gross worker, more than one BIS person. And they also have a new system, a new uh, kind of center, which is called BISOR. It's an impairment services outreach. There's one in Battle Creek. These programs are aimed more at not legally blind, but low vision vets. And they're mostly community-based, and there's, there's a lot of them now. Uh, there's also another one called low vision, and I don't remember the last word, uh, also in each of these, and they're more like low vision clinics, and there's even two levels of them. There's one in uh, there's kind of an intermediate level, one in Detroit, but then there's a, a an ups, one more step up in terms of services uh, in Saginaw, Bay City area. Low vision clinics, basically, but I don't remember the exact word. <clears throat> So they have, they have upgraded their, their services unbelievably in the last five years. There was no such thing as, as this visitors thing just four years ago or five. It's all new. And they, they've completely gone after this low vision market and uh, services in a big, big way just recently. So you got the name of VISOR. What is it? Let me see what they. Vision Impairment Services Outreach Rehabilitation. <laughs> Just remember visors. Vision Impairment Service Outreach Rehabilitation. <clears throat> One of their guys is in our distance ed program. Okay, and, and the VRT's role in those in those uh, in the VR in the veteran system is they're called living skills or communications instructors there. What was that? I'm sorry. Living skills instructors or communication instructors, depending on what what they work in. If they if they're teaching living skills, meaning food preparation, uh, personal management, activities of daily living, etc., then they're called living skills instructors. If they're teaching Braille, uh, handwriting, other communication things, then they're called communication instructors. The only way to become a, that I know of, is to become a BROS or a VIS coordinator is to be in the system and then step up to those positions.
So you so where do you start when you first go in? Just you start in a in a center or in a visors program. Okay. Or in a low vision clinic. You can't I don't know of anyone who's moved right into a bros. Viz or a bros position. That's why I said to you the other day that even if you go into a center-based VA job, you may well end up being a field-based teacher anyway at some time. Remember? Yep. Yep. Because it's a, it's money step up, it's independent step up, it's you know after most people after they've worked in a center a long time commonly want to, to get some freedom. Lots of people don't like to jump right into a into a field-based position right away because they don't have a lot of support maybe. I, I much preferred being out. In a field Do you know what's after bros? Huh? Do you know what's after bros, the next step up after that? President of the U.S. I think. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, the only thing after that would be a like a assistant chief or something. Okay, the private system. Let's talk about it a bit. <clears throat> um, the private system basically isn't a system. <laughs> it's, a, it's a lot of not-for-profit agencies that are set up to, to serve people with vision impairments. Uh, some states, such as New York and Pennsylvania, yeah, not Pennsylvania, yeah, New York and Pennsylvania, have um, New York is a, an especially good example though have like I don't know maybe 20 or 30 or maybe even more probably more probably more like 40 or 50 such places and the one in Utica New York has a has, has a na an annual budget I think something like 75 or 80 percent of the commission of Mich in Michigan. Say that again? It has, it's so big that it has a, a budget nearly as big as the Commission for the Blind in Michigan. This one town, one blindness agency. So it's private system, it's just like a grouping of smaller. It's not a group. They have no Our relationship to each other. Okay. All I'm saying is that there are a lot of private, non-for, not-for-profit. Non-profits. Yeah. Just like, the, you know, Goodwill is an example. They don't serve. They don't serve blind people in person. Oh, let me back up here. These places serve. I should say what they do. I guess. They they do two things in this system. They don't do the first three steps. Of, of the state both we have system which is what which are what uh, just think about it assessment they don't they don't determine eligibility they don't write and they don't do program assessments and they don't write program IPE plans so what do they do EFT and vocational services that's right they provide but, personal adjustment training and they provide vocational training. That How do means they know who they're working for mostly. Hmm. What's the difference between Michigan and New York? If New York has 50 of those things and Michigan has three, why would that be? They have a small population. population. Huh? Population. Nope. Money. Ah, New York State has. I mean, Michigan has close to the population. If you take New York City out of it, they certainly do. 
the state contracts with these these places. But what? Who does? What do you mean? This this. The state, state contracts VR with them agency. here too. They, they contract with them here too. But what's the difference? Why is it different there than here? They both contract with the state. Well, the state in New York doesn't want to do uh, personal adjustment training. No. Well, it's not that they don't want to. It's that they don't have time. No, they don't have a center. Oh, yeah. They don't have a state center. That's why all those places flourished. So instead of having a Michigan State Center, they have private centers everywhere that provide those two last steps. And if you look around, there aren't that many state centers. The big ones are in what? Michigan, Texas, Virginia, uh, Florida. <clears throat> Maybe New Jersey is not all that big. Um, Iowa, Nebraska. Yeah, they're little though. Oh. But yeah, they do have them. So when you say a state center, there really aren't ten. There aren't ten states that have centers of, of any of any consequence. There really are five big ones that have, that serve say thirty or forty people. May I ask, just to clarify that, when you say a state center, are you essentially saying some version of a commission for the blind? No, I'm not. That's not a center. Okay, I'm confused. What? What's a center mean? A place where you go, right? Like a residential place to get... That's right. Okay. Oh, oh. Residential center. <clears throat> All right. Let's go back and clarify, though. So there's five steps that people go through during the rehabilitation program. They get... They, if you're talking about the VR program, we just set aside the, the veterans program for a second because the rest of the country operates around this vocational rehab system. So the first step is you, you determine the eligibility. Second, they assess you. Third, they write you a plan. Fourth, they provide you with, with personal adjustment training and skills so that you can go out and do this job. And then they provide you some kind of vocational training. Well, this vocational training and, well, let's talk about personal adjustment training first. B BRTs and O&Ms operate in what settings? The two major settings are? Centers and itinerary. Centers in your home or in a center-based residential place, like down here in, at the Michigan Center, uh, the Training Center for or they come to your house <clears throat> so what I said was <clears throat> in Michigan we have and, and four or five other or maybe ten other states have so-called residential rehabilitation centers that that the Michigan Commission for the Blind and the Virginia Commission for the Blind and the Texas Commission for the Blind and the Florida Commission for the Blind, et cetera, operate. And so they send all of their, as many clients as they can, to those facilities, 30, 40 people. And the rest they serve in their home. However, in New York, and in Pennsylvania, and in most of the rest of the country, there is no such place. Therefore, if they're gonna get comprehensive Services, they got to do it in in a in a private center. That makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, the it's this is in the book, by the way, y'all. And I'll I'll tell you what you should be reading before we quit here today. If I can get my watch to work, I'll see how much time we have. Just a quick question before you move on. Because you said the private system, they do not do the first three steps. The what? You said they do not do the first three steps. No. They're not allowed to. Why? Because I'm not understanding that mm -hmm. in practical terms. Because they have to uh, be deemed eligible to even... Because, so you said when right. you come... You're right, but why can't a private agency do that? 
because they don't have all the funding. Like Remember what I said about who oversees all of rehabilitation? Mm -hmm. Federal. And who decide? And what is a regulation? The state provides the services. That's right. And the state provides. So the, so the feds decide how it's going to be done. And the state does it. And the state does it. The state can do it however they want. They can have a center or they can give you the money at your little center. Uh -huh. But they have to do the first part. The state has to do the eligibility determination. The state has to do the assessment. And the state has to do the program. Then they go out and find vendors for the rest of it. Okay. Makes sense? So they're getting services in, from the state and... They're getting, well, that's not really a service. They're getting assessed, and the, and the program is being written by the state counselors. And then somebody else kind of carries it out, or, or see to it that it's carried out type of thing? When they do, but the, the counselor is all the time sticking his or her nose in that agency's face to make sure that it's done okay. right. Okay. Because the feds are after the state to make sure it's done right, right? Okay. <clears throat> the rest of you get it? Yep. Mm -hmm. Do you? Are there some states, I think, I'm thinking of Ohio, that have both centers and the private sector? No, there's no state center in Ohio. They're all private. Even Cincinnati and Columbus? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty, yeah, Columbus is also they're all they're all private okay cleveland society toledo site center cincinnati cloverneck uh, columbus are all private okay and so it's a very same state